hopefully. And then I just want to say thank you for joining the event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the webinar will discuss uh, topics including CPC history and its uh, suppression of Chinese people, especially in Xinjiang and Tibet, on the danger of China, Taiwan and China, US uh, tension. We have, can discuss uh, on tension in the South China Sea and China's aggressive behavior toward India, Japan, and Australia. And also we could uh, touch on the challenges and implication of ASEAN growing dependence on China and explore China debt trap diplomacy. That is uh, the, the topics uh, could be uh, could uh, discuss uh, today. I would like uh, to welcome to our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Professor uh, Karl Tayo. Welcome to the, the event. And Dr. Pranesa Saha, Dr. Ayat Swani, and also Anjaya and Dr. Dian will uh, coming uh, today. Please uh, allow me uh, to request uh, Professor Carl Taylor to first uh, speaker. And I would like to share first about the short uh, uh, biography of uh, the first speaker. This is uh, Professor Carl Taylor is a uh, Emeritus uh, Professor of Politics and Visiting Fellow School of Humanities and Social Science, the University of New South Wales, Canberra, February 2018 until December 2020. He is also Director of Tire Consultancy, a small business register in Australia in 2002 that provides critical analysis of current regional security issues and other research support to selected clients. So welcome, Professor, and then I would like to request for the first uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the, the Center for having invited me. I, I was trying to share the screen. I don't think that's working. But uh, what I'd like to do today is address the broad theme with the following uh, topics, looking at China as a security state, uh, looking at Xi, Xi Jinping at the apex of China's power structure, uh, look at what he wants globally and regionally, look at the Belt and Road Initiative, look at China and the South China Sea, and end with a little more detail on Australia-China relations uh, that are uh, have just been through a pretty bad patch. If I take the first issue, China as a security state, uh, I'm relying on a book on China's uh, public security state that I reviewed for the Nordic Journal uh, of Human Rights several years ago. And it, it, it's a blockbuster detailed uh, with Chinese sources on the evolution of their security and intelligence organizations. <clears throat> and since the 1950s, after the People's Republic of China uh, emerged on the mainland, the Ministry of Public Security and a Chinese People's Public Security Force became more institutionalized and professional as they came under the, the control and direction of the party, the Chinese Communist Party Political Bureau <clears throat> and Central Party Secretariat. These organizations and security and intelligence have played an active role in elite politics and factional power struggles within the communist parties over the year uh, and the Chinese state. And the top leaders, the paramount leaders, and that now includes Xi Jinping, have used their informal connections to exert personal control over the security forces uh, from their lofty offices as head of general secretary of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, relying on this uh, book by Xi Guo, uh, China's Security State, Philosophy, Evolution, and Politics, it concludes this long historical analysis with the following. The Communist Party of China believes that China is threatened by Western hostile forces led by the United States, and that those forces are attempting to westernize, divide, and overthrow the Chinese Communist Party by supporting democracy activists, religious groups, including the practitioners of Falun Gong, separatists, Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Taiwan, and political uh, dissidents. 
So that puts the frame uh, for China's abuse of human rights among its people. I won't go into detail about the Uyghurs or Hong Kong, but I now want to, to say that having highlighted the role of intelligence and security services, we look at the rise of Xi Jinping to the apex of power in China. He's now considered in the core of the party's leadership. In 2012, we became general secretary of the party, at the same time chairman of the Central Military Commission, the interface, interface between the party and the military and the military intelligence services. Following year 2013, we became president of the People's Republic of China. Five years later, the two term limits on that office were lifted and it's expected uh, he'll be nominated again for a third term. Uh, in 2013, he became head of the party's national security commissions, and then subsequently developed a range of central leading groups, and he is the head of each and every one of them, including the central leading group for comprehensively developing reforms, and the central leading group for internet security and information. Since coming to power, Xi Jinping's uh, calling card has been to promote the Chinese nationalism with key terms like the great dream of natural of national revitalization <clears throat> or great national rejuvenation. This is elite nationalism, but he's promoted mass nationalism that a particular moment, a particular moments has taken on an anti-Japanese, anti-foreign tone, exhibiting Chinese chauvinism, aggressive patri patriotism, Chinese impunity against uh, what they feel is wrong, wrongdoings by the West, and hacktivism and the use of social media to criticize and attack foreign states and their leaders. <clears throat> hacktivism takes both commercial and intelligence forms. Now, what does Xi Jinping want? And I apologize because I'm using uh, the following points from a presentation I also gave to you over a year ago. They were under Chatham House rules, but I know because I was personally there, the person who attended, fluent in Mandarin, has visited China over a hundred times and has held very high office in his country of birth. And he has listed these as following. Obviously first, keep the Chinese Communist Party in power. Secondly, uh, uphold national unity and territorial integrity. And that means suppressing the Uyghur separatists, the democracy movement in Taiwan, recovering Taiwan, and important for us, implicitly the four shahs or island groupings in the South China Sea, Pratis, Macclesfield Bank, Paracels, and Spratleys. Third, to develop an economy and avoid the middle income trap, and COVID has set back Chinese economic growth. Fourth, to protect the environment, uh, so economic reforms can, so economic development can occur. <clears throat> now, with with those goals, and I, um, uh, I continue. That was four goals. There, there are eight. Develop a first class military is the fifth goal. To push the U.S. back uh, from the first island merit chain to create a maritime zone for China's dominance create continental security through the Belt and Road Initiative, grow markets, and make a gravitational pull towards Beijing of those countries uh, where China is the largest <clears throat> trading partner. And finally, uh, to rejig the international system with China at the center, and from it have a, a series of concentric circles of interest and shape the rules of the international order uh, in China's favor. Now, if I turn to the China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, we can note that uh, it offers economic inducements, grants, loans, and concessions, but countries in the region have varied in how they've responded to it. Uh, India uh, remains adamantly opposed to it, but there are countries uh, that are somewhat supportive, and Thailand uh, could be put in that category, along with Cambodia. And countries that are uh, cautious and taking part uh, would include Indonesia uh, with its high speed rail, other projects, uh, and Malaysia, which 
under various prime ministers has rejigged some of the agreements with China itself. <clears throat> but the Belt and Road has led rise, to, led rise to the idea of debt trap diplomacy. And that's a two way street. In some cases, China is the instigator and they take advantage. On the other hand, it's sometimes uh, craven elites in the receiving countries uh, that, that aid and abet uh, this behavior by China for their own interest. And China aims through this uh, to subordinate states along the Belt and Road, as I say, and pull them into China's orbit. It offers non-interference in their affairs. So this is qualified uh, against the strings attached by the West. The non-interference means China is willing to support any leader or political system as long as it continues uh, to favor China's interest. So it can support a Hong Sen in Cambodia, and it can support someone else in another country, as long as those conditions remain. China co-ops local leaders, and China is not only just the government, but it's Chinese business enterprises that often act uh, aggressively on their own uh, to gain economic influence, to acquire resources needed for China's development, to provide development assistance and concession, concessional loans to bind these countries to China, create trade dependency, and develop Chinese enclaves where overseas Chinese settle uh, and work in, in those countries, particularly, for uh, example, in Cambodia itself. Moving on uh, to look at China and the South China Sea. There we can look at uh, the actions by non-military active under the, the heading gray zone operations. And that's the use of coercion and intimidation below an armed attack. <clears throat> and these include uh, as actors, the paramilitary forces, the China Coast Guard, maritime militia and fishing fleets. They harass the maritime law enforcement vessels of literal states, their fishing boats, they harass foreign hydrocarbon survey ships at the service of national oil companies, uh, Petronas uh, in, in Malaysia, for example. And most recently in the Philippines, a Taiwan scientific survey ship mapping the ocean floor to find fault lines that could help predict earthquakes. And this China interfered with that. And these forces are used in a variety of ways, swarming, several hundred vessels at Whitson Reef in the Philippines two years ago, squatting, showing up and not fishing, but occupying fishing areas in the Philippine waters so that the Philippine fillers, Filipino fishermen can't access them. And satellite imagery showing these guys aren't even fishing. They haven't got their nets out. They're just being paid to sit there and squat. And the use of high powered uh, water cannons uh, against maritime fishing boats. Uh, uh, sorry, Coast Guard. But in addition, in, in a very new development, China has begun to use military aircraft and ships to, op to oppose the deployments of foreign military forces in the region, and most recently has made this vertical, not just confrontation at sea against American freedom of navigation operations, but against aircraft. And so United States Poseidon P-8A aircraft, also owned by the Royal Australian Aircraft uh, Air Force, sorry, have been intercepted in flights over the uh, South China Sea. And in, Viet in Australia's case, a Chinese jet flew up around the plane and in front of it and released flares and chaff and so that the metal components of the chaff were ingested in the Australian aircraft's engines. Meanwhile, China's, uh, Cambodia's uh, Air Force, which is on UN duty to enforce UN sanctions against North Korea, have been repeatedly buzzed by Chinese aircrafts. And then we have an incident in Australian waters in its exclusive economic zone where an Australian patrol aircraft flying at a safe distance found itself the subject uh, of a laser, a laser rangefinder uh, operated from a Chinese a military vessel in the sea. Now I'd like to conclude and, and, and give a, a bit of detail here on Australia's China relations. Um, and there are four reasons why they've deteriorated uh, from about 2018. Australia had real concerns and would not sign on to China's Belt and Road Initiative, thinking that that 
uh, during the Trump administration could undermine uh, the US uh, in the region. Second, Australia has been subject to covert and surreptitious extensive Chinese interference in Australia's domestic affairs, and particularly our overseas Chinese community and its Chinese language press. Third, China has flouted international law and has militarized the South China Sea. The flouting of law, ignoring an arbitral tribunal decision that went against it, and, and militarizing seven artificial islands. And finally, what China claims is the trigger has, was its lack of transparency in its management of COVID-19 when it first broke out in Wuhan City. The Australian Prime Minister of the day called for an independent investigation, and China really took umbrage at that. How has China responded? Well, wolf warrior diplomats had their day, and they spewed diplomatic invective and criticism against our leaders and Australia itself. All contacts with Australian ministers have been frozen now for over two years uh, until the new government was elected. They threatened to take economic sanctions and then imposed $20 billion of sanctions and restrictions and tariffs on Australian exports to China, including beef, barley, wine, wheat, timber, lobsters, coal, and they remain in place today. And then where it hurts, they began to discourage tourists and students from traveling to Australia. The tourists spend money and, this, and many of our universities are heavily dependent on overseas students and their, and their programs. Uh, so, so that has been it. Then to make the point, if and this is for regional people, China produced a bill of goods of 14 points that it wants Australia to change. And when you listen to them, think of how your country would react. They complained about Australia's decisions on foreign investment, claiming that 10 attempted acquisitions by Chinese firms were blocked by Australia on national security grounds. And China said that isn't sufficient. Uh, and they put restrictions on Chinese investment in infrastructure, agriculture, and animal husbandry. China objected, that's one. Two, Australia banned Huawei technologies and ZTE uh, from its 5G network. And China said it was, Australia was doing US bidding. Foreign interference legislation that was targeted against all foreign, uh, we didn't have a law that prohibited overseas money from coming into our political parties, that and economic interest. China said, targeted China without any evidence being provided. Fourth, uh, Australia politicized and stigmatized normal exchanges and bilateral cooperation and created barriers in imposing restrictions and revoked the visa of Chinese scholars at our Confucian Institutes, for example. Fifthly, uh, Australia called for an independent, independent inquiry into COVID-19. That's political manipulation uh, echoing a US line. Sixthly, Australia engaged in wanton interference in China's Xinjiang province where the Uyghurs live, Hong Kong and Taiwan affairs, and, and spearheaded a crusade against China in multilateral forms. If this sounds awkwardly wording, it's the English translation that China provided the press. The seventh grievance, Australia was the first non-literal country in the South China Sea to make a statement to the UN Commission on Limits of the Continental Shelf. Australia joined Indonesia and other country in upholding UNCLOS. Number eight, uh, Australia sided with the U.S. in an anti-China campaign and spread disinformation uh, from the U.S. Uh, relating to China's containment back then of, of COVID. Uh, ninth, uh, Australia passed legislation that scrutinized agreements between Australian institutions and foreign governments. Uh, China says it targeted China. And uh, in particular, it was aiming at the Australian state of Victoria's nominal participation in the Belt and Road, whereas the federal government wouldn't endorse it. Uh, Bill of Grievance 10, providing funds to an anti-China think tank, that's our Australian Strategic Policy Institute funded by defense, that spread untrue reports, peddled lies around about Xinjiang and so-called Chinese infiltration aimed at manipulating public opinion against Australia. 
our security forces found that China was the top rank uh, counterintelligence threat. Grievance number 11, an early dawn search and reckless seizure of a Chinese journalist home and properties without any charges or giving any explanations. And that was involved with trying to bribe a Australian politician. And the final three uh, of grievances, thinly veiled accusations were made by Australia against Chiber on cyber attacks without any evidence. Our defense subcontractors have been subject to Chinese hacking. The 13th grievance, outrageous condemnation of the governing party of China by members of parliament and racist attack against Chinese or Asian people uh, in Australia. And for, 14th, unfriendly or antagonistic reports on China by the media poisoning the atmosphere of bilateral relations. Of course, we are a democracy and can't control what the media says. So an Australian, uh, from all this, from an Australian perspective, why did China punish Australia in this way? And how should I, Australia respond? Well, we have a new government, but the old government decided to keep a low profile to avoid irritating China and to work on the relationship and make comments in response to Chinese criticism as appropriate. So Australia as a small country is being punished for failing to comply with China demands. And that's the object lessons for other countries in the region. Xi Jinping wooed Australia to join the Belt and Road Initiative. The four, Prime Minister wouldn't go, go along with it. And he acted as a failed suitor. He was angry. Uh, another, that's a, a reason that's been advanced. So punish Australia for, for not favoring the Belt and Road. And finally, that Australia's defiance would embolden others to resist. So Australia had to be taught lessons and other countries warned about it. So I conclude on this, we've had a new election, uh, a, a election and a new government has come into office. And just prior to election, a new Chinese ambassador arrived who replaced the wolf warrior. And he adopted a very softly, softly approach in his words. The, the election results brought the Labour government under Anthony Albanese into power. And so that pro provided an opportunity for a reset theoretically because they weren't, the Labour government wasn't part of the, the attacks and the issues uh, over the last three years of the coalition government. China has insisted uh, through Wang Yi, its state councillor and foreign minister, that political relations must be improved first. The Albanese government has replied, uh, China must lift the economic sanctions and punitive uh, financial restrictions on Australian exports first. But at the Shangri-La dialogue and at the meeting of the WTO, the defense and trade ministers of both countries have tested the water by holding the first ministerial contacts. And Wang Yi, in fact, sent a the first communication from China in two years, congratulating the Labour government on its elections. But more recently, our prime minister is attending a NATO meeting uh, in Spain, and China has just today announced that actions like that, where NATO has criticized China, uh, have incurred uh, China's wrath, but China also aimed a barb at Australia's prime minister, declaring that support for NATO in these activities could harm a reset in relations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Carl Thayer. Uh, speaking from Canberra, I think uh, Canberra time is uh, almost uh, in the afternoon. Uh, speaking broadly about the, how the uh, China, China powers growing and becoming, you know, um, concerns not only neighbors but globally. And Professor Carl Tayer mentioned about how China responds to the several issues regarding the uh, China's bilateral relationship. And ladies and gentlemen, we will continue uh, with the second uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Dina Prapto Raharja. I believe uh, Dr. Dina position in Jakarta or the other city, I just want to tell. But uh, let me uh, firstly uh, explain about the little bit uh, uh, short bio of uh, Dr. Dina. Uh, Dr. Dina has earned Doctor of Philosophy 2007 and Master of Arts 2005 from Department of Political Science of Ohio State University, USA. 
with major in comparative politics and minor in international political economy. Uh, she received various research grants and fellowships, among others, the alumni grants for graduate research and scholarship, uh, Sigma C Research Fellowship from Frederick Albert Sithum and in Jakarta, uh, Research Fellowship from Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, and Research Fellow from TSIS Jakarta. And Dr. Dina joined the Venus University in Jakarta in March 2017. Uh, please welcome Dr. Dina uh, for uh, your presentation. We will help you uh, during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asep Setiawan and Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Greetings to all panelists. Uh, I'm joining from Chiwi Day. Uh, it's actually one of the uh, district in uh, West Java. I'm doing a field uh, study. And so I'm in between roads. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for uh, TCS to help me with the presentation. Uh, my basis for sharing with you what, uh, what I will share this afternoon is no less than 25 years of experience in the uh, practical level uh, of public policy uh, and foreign affairs. So I'm not just a researcher, but I've been uh, teaching uh, diplomats at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the neighboring countries in the past no less than 10 years. Um, and of course, my circle of uh, colleagues includes the diplomatic board. So the, I think I'm going to discuss two uh, main questions about China, yeah, since we're going to talk about China. The key questions are, where is China heading? We know that uh, in the past, um, let's say 20 years or so, we've been questioning whether the rise of China will be peaceful and beneficial to all, or whether there will be intended as well as unintended consequences uh, of the China rise. Uh, the next slide, please. And I will also respond to the same question that uh, Professor Tyer mentioned earlier, how best to handle China. Next slide. Based on the documents, uh, that we can assess on China, we know for sure that uh, China has turned uh, into a regional player and uh, then global player. To my observation, China has reached a point of no return in its global outreach, not only in its uh, economic uh, engagements, it also expanded its uh, access to infrastructure, uh, technology, military industry, education has also been impressive, their investment. So if we uh, noted just these two pictures, for instance, China has turned into the world's biggest purchasing power, not only uh, just before the pandemic began in 2020, but also in the next 30 years. It will surpass uh, India, the US, and Indonesia. The world's GDP uh, purchasing, for, uh, purchasing power parity of China is also surpassing so many countries in the world. Next slide. So if we look at this uh, picture and then compare with the uh, US military presence uh, overseas, we can see that China is not only rising economically, it also rising in uh, its military presence. Um, we know that in terms of um, magnitude, the US military presence remains the largest in the world. Not only it has lots of military bases across the world, it has access to arrangements uh, as well as military cooperation across the world. Next slide. And if you see China's string of pearls, you also see the spread is also increasingly uh, enlarged, uh, not only in the South China Sea, uh, but also uh, in farther part of Asia and Pacific. It does so many different things, not only um, you know, military facilities, but also port facilities and uh, other kinds of uh, engagements. Next slide. If you look at this um, China Belt and Road Initiative that was mentioned earlier, 
one thing that I would like to mention on this uh, matter is this is that that uh, the past let's say ten years or so this initiative was welcomed by countries in Asia and uh, Pacific, uh, Japan, India. Uh, welcome the initiative of China and responded accordingly. So at the business and business level, all these new connections basically become uh, new corridors uh, and hope yeah, for people uh, who work in the uh, business sectors to expand um, connectivity, not only through the seas, but also through uh, inlands. Countries like uh, CLMP, for instance, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, in ASEAN, if we want to look specifically into this neck of the wood, you can see that they become much more hopeful that they too can uh, increase their share of benefits from globalization and integrated economic activities. Next slide. One thing we also aware of in, uh, in the rise of China, we, I say it's an uh, unintended consequence of uh, China rise, which is the South, Ch South China Sea conflict. Next slide, please. We noticed that uh, there has been territorial claims over the sea. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can also uh, see that uh, basically China has not only claims uh, uh, over the territories that used to be uh, ASEAN member states um, territory. They also uh, develop new islands, reclamate islands. Uh, go to the next slide, please, for the picture. Um, and not only that, these islands are then de further developed into uh, military bases, complete with equipments, complete with personnel. And so to some extent, uh, interestingly, the heightened suspicion uh, is not growing necessarily inside of ASEAN, but beyond ASEAN. The US, Australia uh, has been specifically very angry about this. The US have asked to secure freedom of navigation. And recently we know that uh, it also built an alliance with uh, the UK and Australia. And just uh, the past two days, G7 countries and NATO are also responding to make sure that China is not going beyond what is acceptable to the NATO countries. So the perception, I'd say the perception is that ASEAN is not capable of handling this matter and that China is being imperialistic in its tendency. I'm not going to touch first on um, how to manage uh, China in this, but I would like to raise the uh, possibility here, the, the um, ways of looking at this that is rather different also in perception is that China in reality is building its military power to have prominence in its surrounding areas. So if we go back to that picture that I presented to you earlier, uh, what has been missing is the international rules about sharing space for military defense what is not allowed, what is not allowed in military defense, that has been missing internationally, multilaterally. The UN doesn't have the uh, dialogues about this matter. So what has been uh, raised is exactly the feeling that uh, Professor Thayer mentioned, this and that, this and that, but uh, no dialogues mechanism has gone into the international multilateral mechanism to discuss about this. What has ASEAN do? Well, China, we realize that China has a different model to expand its power compared to the US and its allies. Is it bad? Well, the message here is that let's manage it with peace. We don't know exactly where is it heading, but clearly the space is there for, uh, for all powers to share. Next slide. <clears throat> um, our biggest concern in Southeast Asia in Indonesia is that all of these alliances, uh, all of these powers are building their own narratives that are not necessarily friendly to each other. Unfortunately, it's not just China that militarized uh, itself in our neck of the wood. We know that China, yes, they have bombers, they have tested um, 
different kinds of uh, weapons uh, in our neck of the wood. Um, and that um, the claim over the nine dotted line has no uh, basis and it is disputed. But ASEAN is very much aware of the very negative consequences of raising weapons, of using uh, military approach against military approach. That is just deadly. We have uh, our worst experience in that. So the best thing that ASEAN has been doing, and I think this other country should appreciate, is that ASEAN remains true to its mechanism to dialogue. ASEAN looks and care for the architecture of the region among itself and in its relations with the major powers. We are very much aware that the deteriorating effect of the Ukraine-Russia war is coming to our neck of the wood. And unfortunately, the um, G7 allies and NATO are trying to take away what used to be within the control of ASEAN uh, over its region. And this is very much something I'm very concerned about. And I'm very sure President Joko Widodo is very much aware of this as well. If we look closer at China uh, Party Political Bureau, now I'm looking at the question about, uh, so I've responded to the question of intended and unintended consequences of where China is heading, right? Uh, the unintended consequences is the uh, Western countries, G7 countries reaction. Our reaction in Asia, basically you can predict, we are always trying to settle things through dialogues and never through weapons. Um, if we look at the questions about how best uh, to handle China, this is my last part. You can see that uh, China Political Party Bureau, next slide, if you see the fan of China, this is the fan of power that I took from, uh, from the uh, thing thing. And uh, I like this picture a lot because uh, if you look at the um, dynamics within China, um, China is consolidating its efforts along with uh, con consolidating its power domestically, along with the pressures coming from the outside countries. Will this not happening if, uh, if the external pressures are not happening? Uh, of course, we, that's, uh, that logic needs to be uh, reassessed as well. But if you look uh, at how Xi Jinping has grown support uh, from within, uh, I think looking at the um, psychology of China, the psyche of Chinese uh, leaders and politicians, they are uh, so used to commands. They are so used to lines of commands. So if you uh, test their loyalty to their leadership, you only provoke them to do the worst. That's one thing you have to remember. So um, the next slide, please. Next, next, next. I think um, I'm trying to remind all of us that when it comes to China in the region, we cannot just talk about China and how our country feels about it. We have to think about the overall world order that's now facing us and changing the landscape, not only of uh, military issue, but social and economic affairs. The things that we have built uh, together with China, together with the US, together with Australia should not uh, come into vain. That's uh, the one thing that I really hope any of dialogues like this would um, tone down our anxiety, uh, heighten our positive expectations that rather than pulling guns and yell at each other, Let's look about uh, the various ways by which we can talk everyone's out uh, into more peaceful solution to this sharing space uh, between powers. With that, I end my sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dina Praptorahar. Just speaking from West Java in uh, Chiwide, Bandung, I think my home. <laughs> region, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Budina is one of the busiest scholars, so it's uh, moving around in Indonesia and around the world. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much. Let's see uh, now. Uh, just one, I, I don't want to comment, but uh, this is uh, confirming that there is a co big concerns of the China's growing powers. Uh, but uh, basically, ASEAN countries uh, are better to make a dialogue rather than to confrontation. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we will discuss this later. And uh, now we are going to New Delhi to see Dr. Prem Mesa Saha first before and then uh, later uh, Dr. Ayan Shwani. Uh, let's uh, see the short bio of uh, Dr. Premesa Saha is, uh, I just want to read the short bio of uh, Dr. Premesa Saha. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Premesa Saha could speak Indonesian. Uh, uh, he is an associate fellow with uh, ORF's Strategic Studies Program. The research focuses on Southeast Asia, East Asia, Oceania, and the emerging dynamics of Indo Pacific region. Previously, she has been an associate fellow at the National Maritime Foundation in the Pacific Security Studies Fellow, sponsored by the U.S. State Department um, in Hawaii. And then Premesa has completed a PhD from Center of Indo-Pacific Studies School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals like Maritime Affairs, Indonesian Quarterly in Jakarta, and newspaper and magazine like the Jakarta Post. Dr. Premesa Saha, please welcome to present your uh, perspective on our discussion today. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Pa Asep, uh, for, the, for the very welcoming introduction. And I want to thank uh, Pa Anjaya for the invitation. And um, so uh, the brief that was given to me was to speak on the South China Sea, but the previous two speakers have touched extensively on it. Um, so what... Uh, I'll touch on certain aspects of the South China Sea dispute uh, that China has been exercising its aggressiveness in, uh, in the region. But I also want to, uh, I think that uh, since you said that the perspective from New Delhi, so what I would like to also do is how um, India-China relations have um, been impacted, especially after the June 2020 Galwan Valley clash that uh, is still an ongoing one at the border, though some disengagement has happened, but still it's an ongoing um, clash, a border clash that India is facing with China, how that has impacted India's overall relations with China and uh, has also helped India in developing a much uh, stronger vision for the Indo-Pacific because we do not yet have a strategy in place. Uh, like USA has uh, released a lot of papers on the Indo-Pacific. They have a strategy in place. Australia also through its foreign policy white paper. India does not release any such white paper and defense white papers. So we do not have a strategy or a policy in place, but we do have an Indo-Pacific vision in place. Uh, so how has all these evolved uh, in response to China's aggressiveness in India's border and to a certain extent in the South China Sea also? Uh, so if we are talking about Chinese aggressiveness in the South China Sea, um, so everybody is talking about the island reclamation from the 2013 onwards. But I think if we go back, uh, the uh, you know, the aggressiveness existed even in the 1970s when uh, the clash between China and Vietnam happened uh, surrounding the Paracels, the Spratlys, uh, 1988, the 1992 mystery reef clash. So China's aggressiveness has been there uh, when we talk about the South China Sea dispute. But I think uh, the main reason why so much talks is happening is because of the extensiveness of this aggression in terms of the reclamation activities, the artificial island reclamation activities, um, the fact that... Uh, not just in the South China Sea, we also see such territorial aggression in the East China Sea. Uh, we see um, even in, uh, if we talk about India's case in a backyard in the Western Indian Ocean, though we have not seen any military presence in the Western Indian Ocean yet, but we do see the presence of Chinese research and uh, reconnaissance vessels, survey vessels in the Western Indian Ocean as well. And we keep on talking about Chinese growing footprints in the Western Indian Ocean, be it uh, the previous speaker spoke about string of pearls, be it if we look at South Asia, uh, how China is developing ports around uh, and sometimes uh, there are speculations whether these can be used as naval bases when we talk about our neighbor neighboring countries, be it in Pakistan, uh, be it in Sri Lanka, be it in Maldives. Uh, China has taken uh, uh, various islands on uh, long year leases. So what our Chinese ambitions or objectives uh, remains very unclear when we talk about the string of pearls with relation to South Asia and the Western Indian Ocean as well. Besides this, I think uh, when we uh, talk about the South China Sea, um, 
the U.S. response, uh, I think um, I was very carefully listening, especially to, uh, you know, uh, the ASEAN response, because uh, the U.S.'s response has been freedom of navigation operations. Um, India, uh, sorry, China and U.S., uh, USA is not a signatory of the UNCLOS, and uh, both have very differing uh, op- uh, views on freedom of, na- on innocent passage, um, you know, in territorial waters. And so basically, how U.S.'s phone op is helping ASEAN in the code of conduct discussions, whether it's having having a negative impact on ASEAN's overall standing, uh, whether it's having uh, whether it's affecting ASEAN come up with a, a compromising uh, with a understandable stand with China when we talk about the code of conduct uh, deli- uh, you know uh, discussions is something that needs to be looked into. Because now even uh, other countries like Australia, UK are also engaging in joint exercises with the US in the disputed waters of the South China Sea. How this is helping in the, uh, you know, helping the purpose of the ASEAN countries is something that needs to be looked into. Because as you very rightly mentioned that ASEAN believes in dialogue and um, ASEAN centrality is something uh, which every country talks about when they talk about Indo-Pacific. Uh, ASEAN centrality is a, uh, a, uh, it's like an anthem which is sung by all the leading powers of the Indo-Pacific, be it uh, India, be it US, Australia, Japan, UK, France, even in the EU strategy, uh, which you know just uh, recently released, we see ASEAN centrality. And all of them really uh, all champion that ASEAN is the central geography of the Indo-Pacific. But uh, as I'm hearing the growing voice, uh, the voices from Southeast Asia, these kind of actions which the external players think that they are helping in the purpose of the Southeast Asian claimants, are they really helping the, uh, solve that purpose? Are they really impinging on ASEAN centrality? And if that's so, uh, do they really believe when they say that ASEAN centrality is the very core of the Indo-Pacific? So these are the questions that needs to be looked into when we talk about the uh, uh, you know, country's approaches to China's aggressiveness. Now, if we talk about um, India, for instance, um, we even uh, before Galwan, we did have the Doklam clash as well. And after that, we did see the Wuhan summit also taking place between uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, Xi Jinping. So even after the Doklam clash, India did uh, embark on diplomacy. India did still maintain a very cautious stand when it came to China. Even being a part of the Quad, India has been one of the most cautious players in the Quad, and that has been an, um, a point which has been raised by the other Quad members that it was mostly India's hesitation which did not allow the uh, which uh, did not lead to the release of joint statements in the initial meetings of uh, Quad 2.0 after 2017. So India has uh, maintained ha- did maintain a cautious approach towards China even after the Doklam Valley clash. But the June 2020 clash, uh, the Galwan Valley clash, had actually made uh, has le- led to a huge shift in India's attitude, um, be it towards China from banning of Chinese uh, apps, from banning TikTok to uh, even during the recent uh, meeting between uh, Jay Shankar, uh, between our external affairs minister and the Chinese foreign minister, where uh, India very clearly mentioned that uh, the relations will only improve if China respects the border agreements that the two countries have and that. Uh, what has happened in June 2020 has left a huge trust deficit in India's eyes with regards to China, and that uh, this was a very serious issue which India is not going to take lightly anymore, and India's stand is going to be influenced by this clash. So uh, India no longer, uh, what needs to be understood is many in the Western media has also, when we talk about India's stand, has said that it has been influenced by the US. What US does, India is following. But one needs to also remember that uh, when we internally, the voice from the foreign ministry, especially if we, if you check our external affairs minister's statements, you will understand that the Galvan Valley clash has left a huge dark scar on India's image. It has taken India back to 1962 days, basically, in many ways, in the thinking pattern. And it is going to take a lot of time. And I, and I have grave doubts whether India-China relations are going to... Uh, it is obviously going to remain mutually convenient, but whether it is going to, uh, you know, improve in the real sense of the term, because the Galwan Valley clash has been taken very seriously by the Indian uh, diplom- uh, by the Indian diplomacy and the higher uh, government, higher levels, um, high officials levels, basically. So that will have an impact. 
Uh, so um, another uh, step that India has taken, um, non-alignment. Uh, India has always believed in non-alignment. But now we are talking of something called issue-based partnerships and issue-based alignments. Issue-based partnerships, I won't use the word alignments, but issue-based partnerships. And that justifies our uh, being a part of so many minilaterals and plurilaterals, be it the Quad, be it the uh, India, Australia, uh, Japan, even the India, Australia, Indonesia trilateral. So this justifies that India is trying trying to, uh, you know, uh, fulfill its national interests through these issue-based partnerships, where our purposes are being solved, where our interests are being met, India is joining such initiatives. On the other hand, India is also part of a, an initiative like India, Russia, China. Uh, so there are ways. And if, if there are speculations that India is only following the US's uh, commands, then our stand on Ukraine actually shows that it is not always the case. Even after US's hesitation, India did purchase the S-400 from Russia. So there have been such instances which prove that India is taking its own stand. India has its own standing to emerge as a global player in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, one thing which uh, needs to be understood is even after being a part of the Quad, the equation that India faces with China is very, very different from the other Quad members. Uh, we share a land border with China, which is extremely disputed and sensitive and is at a very sensitive situation even now. So India's policy and India's stand will obviously differ from the other Quad members, even after being a part of the Quad. So that's why India's positions have sometimes not been same, even after being a part of these minilateral groupings. India is, and our foreign minister is very rightly in many places where he has been asked questions like, the whose side is India on? US, China, EU. So India has, and he has mentioned that why should India being such a big democracy and a growing economy choose anybody's side? India has its own side. And in some cases, India's stand has even um, shown that. But, uh, you know, um, from the past, India's China policy has evolved. And it has become much stronger, but obviously much more needs to be done. Even in terms of supply chains, for example, India is entering into other supply chain uh, initiatives like India, Japan, Australia has come up with one. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is another one, though these are in very nascent stages, but at least the effort has been made. Um, but at the same time, India is not a part of the RCEP. India is uh, not a part of the CPTPP. So these uh, things are also, in a way, impacting India's image. But uh, I would be uh, glad to take questions on RCEP and uh, in the later stages if anything emerge, if any questions come out of it. But uh, there are these are also instances which are, in a way, impacting India's image. Um, but at the same time, I think what India has at, at this advantage among the ASEAN countries is also that... Uh, you know, that trust in India is there. And the, there are there is still a lot of scope for India-ASEAN relations to evolve in many ways. Um, and uh, in, so there is already FTA agreements in place and uh, India-Vietnam, India-Indonesia relations and even the recent Brahmos deal show that India-Philippines relations is also growing to a huge extent. Um, in many ways, there are a lot of scope for defense partnerships to evolve. Uh, India is uh, through its, uh, uh, you know, the sale of Brahmos, what India is trying to show that it is trying to become a rec uh, recognizable uh, exporter when it comes to defense purchases and defense industry collaborations, not just an importer of defense weapons. So in these ways, India is trying to develop its image globally. Uh, and that has in a lot way been uh, influenced by Chinese actions. And, um, and that has to be kept in mind that Chinese actions has been one of the main reasons for India's uh, change in approach. Um, with that, um, I would like to conclude and I would be happy to take any questions and comments that come up. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Premesa Saha. I believe uh, speaking from New Delhi, um, I think India, the most uh, one, I think the border is around thousands uh, miles, yeah, and then uh, the most. Uh, as uh, China growing uh, influenced by uh, in the borders in terms of economic and politic. This is uh, very interesting to discuss it later. And then let's, uh, we're going to meet uh, Mr. Ayaz Wani. Uh, let uh, me a little bit introduce the next speakers before uh, Pak Anjaya. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Ayaz Wani is a research fellow at ORF. Mumbai. He is currently working on the project Kashmir Conflict, managing perception and prospectus for peace. 
uh, Mr. Wani also tracks the manners of China, Uyghur, radicalization in Pakistan and Greater Central Asia. He is widely published in international national peer review journals. He has received fellowship from Xinjiang Social Science Academy in Urumqi, Xinjiang, and the University Grand Commission, New Delhi. Mr. Wani is also you say a fellow from, he undertook a two year programs, the European Union and Central Asia in international system. So welcome uh, Dr. Ayaswani for your presentation. Thank you for your kind words and thank you for inviting me to speak on this topic, especially when it comes to Chinese Communist Party. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Chinese Communist Party and it is policy towards Islam. I will go historically. Given the fact that we are now reaching a century of the Chinese Communist Party rule in China. And most of the people think that it was after 2010 that it became China became politically hegemonic and aggressive around the world and also within China. But it is not true. When it comes to Chinese Communist Party and it is policy towards minorities, we have to go back to 1949. Especially when we look into the policies of Chinese Communist Party in 1949, especially in Xinjiang. Because Xinjiang is, was not part of Communist China, neither it was part of China. Because it has its own history with fault lines. It was only till 1949 ruled by China for only 450 years. And it is recorded in history. So what was the culture of Xinjiang? What was the culture of Eastern <laughs> Turkestan before it became part of Chinese Communist Party or China? It was simply a culture which was dominated by shamanism, Islam, Christianity, and Buddhists. However, after Islam reached the Transoxenia in 7th century, and its dominance in Xinjiang was felt after 8th century. So, after Islam became a dominant factor in Xinjiang, they were mostly Sunnis, even though at times it lost its political prominence. For example, during the rule of Karakatis and Mongols, but it still made new inroads and had impact on these dynasties. So of once by the time of 15th and 16th century, it became a socio-cultural factor. Islam became a socio-cultural factor that governed the society of Xinjiang. For example, in 17th century, everyone was praying and everyone was doing what he needed to do under the influence of Islam. So even at times, Sharia was used to enforce governance and civil life during the time of Yaqub rule. Yaqub Beg, who ruled Xinjiang before, during 8, 18th century. Now, on the eve of 20th century, Islam played a major role in Xinjiang. And most of the customs related to Islam were freely celebrated by the Uyghurs. And it had its impact on the Uyghur traditions, their food habits, culture, and even somewhat on judicial system. Because when we see there was evidence that Kazi was heading a court, was appointed on the basis of merit, and besides the other disputes, he was also settle, settling the disputes between Chinese Hans, Chinese merchants, and Muslim merchants of Xinjiang. However, once CCP came into power, it was not having its base, full support in Xinjiang, given its history and its centrifugal tendencies. So they took some conscious setups in Xinjiang first, in first 10 years. And later on, 
later on they tried to erode all the islamic culture in in that part of the world for example when chinese came into power in 1949 they allowed religious freedom to the natives of xinjiang since most of them were muslims by birth as such the chinese communist party translated quran into chinese in 1952 uh, what is more arresting was that they drew parallels between islam and communism in such respects which were much more important for the later like preface some verses of quran were highlighted to describe that islam and communism were not averse to each other but after 1955 when one is the mass migration of ccp cadre started to xinjiang they started somewhat inroads into the islam and uighur culture for example sorry for example ccp started banning the waqf properties and who owned the waqf properties were prosecuted mullahs were imprisoned mosques were destructed and the and some of the mosques and madrasas which were omnipresent in xinjiang were used for pig rearing that is to show some sort of aggression towards muslims so they started somehow i can say that they started the communist orientation of xinjiang and their religion but however one is cultural revolution started they banned each and everything quranas were burned pig rearing was enforced on the muslims mosques were closed religious associations were banned quranic studies were banned and even marriages within the faith were abolished and circumcision one of the basic premises of the muslims was also banned and those people who did circumcision were jailed and this policy remains intact till 1978 one is china started the economic decentralization somehow because they need friends especially in muslim world and arab world they started to show these countries that we are not against islam and they gave some sort of what i mean to say some sort of freedom to uighur muslims and one is again muslims were given freedom to pray in the mosques muslims uh, were given freedom to construct new mosques and somehow somehow they gave a picture of xinjiang in a better way to muslim world for their diplomatic interests but after 1990 the ba- one darin incident happened they once again started their aggressiveness towards islam and the mosques which were already constructed after the economic decentralization were already closed and even the mullahs who were giving the friday sermons and other sermons in mosques they were supposed to be given instructions by ccp cadres first in the urumqi madrasa now after xi jinping came he started a war against this what they are saying that alien culture islam is a alien culture to them and most of the muslims in xinjiang feel betrayed by the ccp's aggressiveness and now there are reports and most of the muslims are in concentration camps for smallest reasons if they are if their relatives are outside china living anywhere in world they will be sent to concentration camps if their relatives are having beard if they were wear they were wear parda or abaya 
they will be sent to concentration camps and secondly what they did during the, after 2010 they used their economic clout to suppress the muslim voices in central asia in turkey in pakistan and other parts of the world and to me the muslim countries became partners of crime with china for example one of the greatest cricketers of south asia shahid afridi in 2009 wrote a tweet about the ccp's policies towards chinese muslims he was forced by pakistani government to delete that tweet so that is the policy of china they want to erode the islamic tradition as islamic culture within xinjiang and even they are trying to tame the muslim countries especially those where they are considered to be the guardians of islam like the countries in middle east saudi arabia turkey malaysia even at times indonesia which are considered to be the guardians and which have more population of islam muslims they have tamed them economically to remain silent on this issue and even at times they have endorsed the chinese policies in xinjiang so the problem of minorities from 1949 when we dig deep into it they have the minorities have never been given a good share by communist china and they have been alienated from time to time by ccp and its creditors and the ccp pollet bureau now the problem lies after one century after 100 years of ccp when in 2000 when in 1921 it was founded in shanghai in one of the industries so problem rise what is the way forward to make china much more responsible towards the minorities whether tibetan minorities whether muslim minorities whether any other minority of china what is the way forward only way forward to me is that west especially usa and european union they need to start some sort of convergence with muslim world so that a sort of pressure will be created against china to save the these cultures minority cultures especially in xinjiang we know more than 2 million people are were in concentration camps and today just now i will read a tweet by iranian foreign ministry on this issue when the the islamic islamic republic of iran tells the united nations human rights council that we regard the high commissioner for human rights visit to china as clear indication of china's constructive and responsible approach towards human rights actually why iran wrote this tweet and why they said this given the economic pressure on the uh, started after the us sanctions on iran and that forced iran to go to china for having 400 billion deal infrastructure deal so that is why there should be some sort of conversion there may be islam muslim countries may be authoritative but there should be some sort of conversion between west and muslim world to checkmate china's policies of minorities especially in xinjiang and tibet and now we know how what they are doing in hong kong what they are trying to do in tai- taiwan so this is the way only way forward and if world remains divided so there will be time within two or three decades that we will see erosion of minority cultures in china thank you i will conclude with this sentence thank you thank you uh... Dr. Ayazwani speaking from New Delhi. I think um, this is very interesting explanation, particularly uh, Chinese uh, attitude toward the Muslim society, Muslim uh, peoples in Xinjiang. 
and ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished speakers, just uh, who just joined us in uh, YouTube uh, streaming, we are now discussion about the China's ruling party at 101 years old. I think uh, is in first of July. History and challenges for the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the audience, uh, let's uh, hear now. Uh, follow the uh, last speakers, uh, uh, our uh, senior um, members. Uh, Mr. Feramala Anjaya, welcome. Pak, this is uh, he is a senior editor at Jakarta Post from 1995 to 2020, and currently he is a senior research fellow of Center for Southeast Asian Studies (CCS) Indonesia. He holds Master of Philosophy degree in Southeast Asian and Southwest Pacific Studies from the School of International Studies. Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Master degree in history from University of Madras, India, and bachelor's degree from Osmania University, Hyderabad. I think uh, Feramala is a senior journalist, and of course, uh, you are still writing for uh, many, many, um, some of uh, publishing in Jakarta and around the world. So welcome, Pak Feramala Anjaya, please, uh, for your um, time about 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Seth. Uh, my sincere greetings to my fellow uh, speakers from uh, Australia and India uh, and Indonesia. Uh, July 1st today is a very important day in the history of China because on this day, uh, around 101 years ago, the Chinese Communist Party, according to the Communist Party sources, was established on this day. And also, it is also uh, 25th anniversary of handing over of Hong Kong to uh, China. That's why today, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping is in Hong Kong. After uh, two years, he never traveled to any outside China. So first time he's uh, attending these uh, uh, celebrations. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, first, uh, I mean, uh, just I will get just a few words about the Chinese Communist Party because Chinese Communist Party was established on uh, 1st July 1921 uh, by two Chinese scholars. One is uh, Chen Duxia and Li Da Zhao. But these two leaders uh, uh, were later uh, ended up in a very tragic situation in 1929 because the Chen was the first secretary general of the Chinese Communist Party, but he was expelled from the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> it is very strange in 1929 and 1931, Li was also executed by a Chinese warlord uh, uh, in China, not by, from the Communist Party. So both were ended in a very uh, uh, bad history. I'm not going to that very long uh, that uh, reg uh, reg uh, history of the Communist Party. China is a country that is ruled by an autocratic communist party whose ideology opposes democracy, freedom, human rights, and religion. The CCP, uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party, the world's second largest political party with 95 million members is notorious for its curiosity and unpredictability since its independence because it has a very violent history because from 19 uh, uh, in the 20s uh, they started this uh, civil war with the Kuomintang ruling party uh, at the time the china's name was uh, Rep uh, republic of china mi mi millions of people were killed in this violence between uh, the chinese communist party and the Kuomintang government forces then uh, on 1st october 1949 uh, China, uh, Chinese Communist Party became victorious and they established the People's Republic of China in 1949. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, during the last 73 years, uh, the 101 year old Chinese Communist Party has transformed China from one of the poorest countries to the world's second largest economy, third biggest military force and a global hegemony. As an emerging global superpower, China, which is also the world's most populous country with 1.45 billion people, 
is directly challenging the dominance of the present superpower, the USA. Today, I would like to shed some light on the potential dangers of China's rise, both economically and militarily. Next slide, please. First, uh, I will talk about the economic threats because uh, China is the second uh, uh, largest economy in the world with a GDP of 20.38 trillion dollars and a record uh, 3.13 trillion dollars in foreign exchange reserves. Uh, and with its new wealth and military strength, it wants to dominate the world by expanding its power and influence throughout the world, including Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. Uh, so in uh, its signature initiative is the 2013 uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which covers 68 countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America with an estimated investment plan of $1 trillion. China adopts predatory economic practices like providing huge subsidies, low taxes, and cheap finances to Chinese companies. Uh, theft of intellectual property rights and forced technology transfers are rampant. It also ignores labor and environmental standards. Many countries have found it difficult to benefit from Chinese trade investments and loans. This we have to uh, take note of it. I think uh, after huge investments, trade, I think no country in, in this world ever benefited. For example, if you see the uh, uh, countries cooperating with, uh, with the U US, like with Japan, we have a success story. We have Australia, we have uh, Korea. So many countries, they became rich because of the very uh, close cooperation or, or trading or uh, uh, working with the US. But in case of Chinese uh, uh, cooperation, we have never seen a success story in the world. No country has ever become rich because of the co cooperation with the China. Uh, then next slide, please. So, and now uh, we will see, uh, because now many people are uh, saying that Indonesia is becoming very close to China. Is that true? I mean, of course, Indonesia uh, is the uh, largest economy in Southeast Asia. And uh, we had uh, 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 relations with China, not that so good. Why so? Because in 1950, we established the diplomatic relations. But in 1967, uh, due to China's Communist Party intervention, we uh, suspended the relations with China from 1967 to 1990. We suspended the relations. So in 1990, again, we re-established the diplomatic relations. Uh, so uh, in 2015, uh, after 1990, the relations were slowly picked up. And in, in 2015, we signed a strategic partnership agreement with China. And also, uh, we, uh, China signed the 2010 China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. So, but Indonesia failed to gain any significant benefits from these two important agreements. For example, people say that we have uh, uh, very good trade investments and also uh, uh, loans. But we, if we see the uh, trade, for example, next slide, please. So our trade with uh, uh, China has been growing. Can you imagine? Uh, like, for example, in 2016, it was just $47.59 billion. Now it reached last year $110 billion. But the main drawback is uh, always the trade was in favor of China because we have to import more from China and we export very slowly. But in the under the Jokowi, President Jokowi's period, the trade uh, uh, deficit is slowly coming down uh, because Jokowi stopped importing uh, uh, many goods from China. So during the last six years, Indonesia has suffered $78.33 billion trade deficit. But uh, if you see the Chinese st statistics, it may be more than $100 billion. So how come we benefited from this? Of course, uh, our, our exports have uh, grown up in recent years. But uh, overall, it was the China which benefited from these uh, uh, trade. 
Next slide, please. Then another big problem with the China is uh, it is it's a debt trap uh, diplomacy because China easily gives uh, provides loans to many countries. So, so that's why many countries uh, they borrow money even they uh, e e exceeding their capacity. So that makes uh, them uh, indebted to China. So like now now recently I mean uh, uh, recently we are seeing. China's close allies, which borrowed heavily from China, one after the other, they are started collapsing because uh, uh, President Jokowi the other day said that around 60 countries in the world will economically collapse due to heavy debt. That heavy debt mainly uh, came from ch uh, China. For, uh, now in, uh, in Asia, I think according to the reports, uh, at, at 25 countries will be affected. The first one, it began with Sri Lanka and Pakistan is on the verge of collapse. And then we have uh, Laos also uh, from Southeast Asia. I think uh, Myanmar and Cambodia may follow and we have already the economies like Afghanistan and also we have uh, like uh, the war torn countries like Syria, Yemen, and also some Central Asian countries, Tajikistan. So these may collapse because they don't have enough money to pay back these debts loans. And also we are facing high inflation because of this Ukrainian war. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we see what kind of projects China has been uh, offering to Indonesia. For example, we can see the high speed rail uh, from uh, Band, uh, Jakarta to Bandung which was badly delayed and now the costs have almost doubled and also according to the economists it may not be beneficial uh, for uh, 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 Indonesia because it will uh, add only loans, more loans uh, because these Chinese high speed rails are not doing well in inside China. The railway company in China is suffering huge losses and they have a huge debt piled up because these, uh, uh, the maintenance costs of these high speed rails are very high. So they are not that profitable. I think only Japanese, I think they have the profitable high speed service in the world. Uh, next slide, please. And also, uh, these uh, loans which were given uh, by Chinese banks or companies to uh, Asian African countries, the corruption is very high. I think uh, Chinese support, supported projects have consistently led to the rise of local corruption through bribes and other means. Corruption has also become rampant in other countries where BRI projects have been launched, such as Kenya, Uganda and Sri Lanka. The Kenyan and Ugandan governments are currently investigating nearly 1,000 separate cases of tax evasion and uh, related bribery by Chinese or Chinese linked companies. Next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, I, we, we, uh, now I want to talk about the security threats because China is at that we are facing so many problems from the uh, COVID-19, which was originated in uh, Wuhan in China and spread to the all over the world. We have not yet recovered, but now suddenly this Ukrainian war broke out. And as a result of these uh, two, the world commodity prices have gone up like anything. People are suffering from everywhere in the world. So, uh, so, but at this worst times, China is building, expanding its military capabilities. I think it is building more, number one, I think in building nuclear weapons, more nuclear weapons, hypersonic missiles, aircraft carriers, etc. So it is uh, keep on building uh, these uh, arms. What, what, what happened? Because of this, uh, uh, this uh, pose a big threat to the Asian countries. Like, for example, the other day in the Shangri-La dialogue, Japanese Prime Minister said Japan will increase its military budget. Indonesia has to increase its military budget. India and Vietnam and all other countries. So it is leading to an arms race in Asia. So that is very bad. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Why we should afraid about China because during the Deng Xiaoping period, China was, uh, uh, I mean, China promised that it would grow only through uh, peaceful means. It will not threaten anybody. But uh, it, has, it, it, it has proved 
But when Xi Jinping came to the power, it changed completely. So he his intention is he wants to uh, take over Taiwan and he wants to uh, take uh, uh, the whole of South China Sea. And he, he has been uh, showing to the world that China is intended to become a global power by challenging the US dominance in the world. So this is leading a very uh, bad situation. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, just recently I attended uh, the Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore. So during the Shangri-La dialogue, the US Secretary of Def Defense Lloyd Austin lashed at China's coercive and aggressive actions in the East and South China Sea. Uh, I read when I mean, Indo-Pacific countries should not face political intimidation economic coercion or harassment by uh, maritime militias. The PRC, the People's Republic of China's moves, threatened to undermine so, uh, security, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Austin said. We seek a region free of aggression and bullying, a world that respects territorial integrity and political independence, that expands human rights and human dignity, and a world in which all countries, large and small, are free to thrive and lawfully pressure their interests, free from coercion and intimidation. We seek inclusion, not division. We seek cooperation, not strife. So this is from the US defense minister. So he is saying that we want, they want to cooperate with South, uh, Southeast Asian countries, and they are, even they are ready to cooperate with China if China agrees. Uh, so this is not for a confrontation. Then uh, also, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have a, a statement from uh, US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. China uses coercion and aggression to systematically erode autonomy in Hong Kong undercut democracy in Taiwan, abuse human rights in Xinjiang and Tibet, and assert maritime claims in the South China Sea that violate international law. So we are united the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region, where countries follow the rules, cooperate whenever they can, and resolve their differences peacefully. And in particular, we will push back if necessarily when China uses coercion or aggression to get its way. Next slide, please. So now we heard the US uh, statements. So what uh, Chinese Defense Minister Wai Feng He said in uh, Shangri-La dialogue, if anyone dares to secede Taiwan from China, let me be clear, we will not hesitate to fight. We will fight at all costs and we will fight to the very end. So that is, uh, I mean, uh, he, uh, he is using a very uh, aggressive tone. Okay, next slide, please. Ah. So actually, uh, China claims more than 90% of the South China Sea, but uh, I mean, uh, based on a nine dash line, now it is 10 dash line, uh, that it, the whole area belongs to it. But in 2016, in this month, July, uh, July so uh, the International uh, uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration, PCA in Hague, ruled very clearly that uh, this China's nine dash line illegal and all its activities in South China Sea are illegal because this tribunal was based on the 1982 unclosed, which China signed and ratified. So uh, it is very clear, but China rejects this tribunal's ruling in, uh, uh, in the South China Sea. Next slide, please. Uh, so wh what is the dangerous thing is China has been increasing its defense budget. You can see from this slide from 2016 to 2021, I think in 2022, it is more than $250 billion. So in the last uh, uh, six years, China spent $1 trillion on military budget. Can you imagine $1 trillion in just six years? It is very dangerous. Then uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, uh, this led to the uh, 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 an arms race in uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, as well as the uh, uh, the U.S. also started uh, this uh, Quad, and also the now it established a military alliance with uh, U.S., uh, U.K., and U, uh, Australia. So th th this is because these all these of Xi Jinping's aggressive. Uh, policies. 
if they do not uh, have these aggressive policies if they don't have that huge military build up they, they, we don't need this kind of organization uh, etc next slide please yeah so what i am saying is uh, uh, even even if we can see the last year i think president xi jinping said we chinese are a people who uphold justice and are not intimidated by threats of force as a nation we have a strong sense of pride and confidence we have never bullied oppressed or subjugated the people of any other country and we never will uh, by the same token we will never allow any foreign force to bully oppress or subjugate us anyone who should attempt to do so will find themselves on a collusion course with a great wall of steel forced by over 1.4 billion chinese people this is the language president xi jinping is saying but even in during the shangri la dialogue also uh, chinese defense minister said in a public forum he said that china never invaded any country it was a complete of uh, a lie because 1962 it was china which invaded in uh, uh, during the, uh, the uh, and also it invaded vietnam and also it had clashes with uh, uh, soviet union so we uh, that's why the indonesian foreign minister recently said in new delhi that ASEAN, south east asian countries feel that there is a lack of strategic trust especially from china because many of these countries do not trust because uh, uh, china always involves uh, uh, conflicts uh, then also they say but for, for example if you see the logic of their a uh, claim of our north natuna sea see far away from china but we are uh, we claim that that north natuna sea is a part of the unclosed treaty because the unclosed treaty says we are eligible for 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone but that china signed and ratified and now say it is uh, belongs to me see come on imagine so it doesn't make any sense so okay anyway what i am saying is now i want to conclude by saying that china may not be a, a danger but the danger comes real danger comes from the chinese communist party not from the uh, because in in china the people's liberation army is not loyal to the chinese state it is loyal to the chinese communist party so that is the danger comes from so we are uh, uh, this communist party rule in the future if it, if it continues it is a great danger for 1.45 billion chinese people inside china because now see you can 40 40 or 30 cities are under lockdown for months they are treating like a, not a human beings the people there were so many demonstrations there were so many uh, protests in uh, uh, social media so that is the major danger and also it is a, 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 the chinese communist party is a very dangerous for hong kong people and also taiwan people so uh, and also uh, uh, we are facing uh, a situation in south china sea uh, in south china sea also so what i am saying is china poses a big threat to the world because for example we have very uh, 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 te- a very serious tension in taiwan strait like where uh, china has been uh, sending its warplane ships and they are conducting uh, naval exercises so if uh, and the us also responding to sending it ships if a clash broke out everybody will be affected not only asians entire world like what what we are suffering from the ukrainian war so it is a great danger the chinese communist party is a great danger to the world thank you pass it Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anjaya, uh, speaking from around Jakarta. And this is uh, the last uh, uh, session of our um, webinar. We do have uh, about 20 minutes uh, and we shall have a discussion. Uh, I would like to put one question and then uh, all of the um, speakers could uh, have a, a response for the question and then uh, followed by a conclusion. because we do have about 20 minutes left uh, in our webinar and um, the question is uh, a collector is uh, put from tcs uh, from the team says uh, uh, as new uh, rising power china is uh, challenging uh, and dominance of the us in the world and will there be any war between the us and china of course this is uh, rather than uh, 
as a pro uh, prediction or maybe speculation uh, uh, the question but uh, this is very important uh, for us and for the australian from india indonesia uh, uh, please uh, professor Tayor, for uh, the first response of uh, to this question whether uh, there will be uh, expected or mr um, we, we do know that Alison uh, have uh, the latest uh, books about the clash of uh, China and US, uh, whether it will be repeatedly historical, uh, repeat ourselves. Please, uh, Professor Tyrus, and followed by Dia, Dina, uh, with uh, uh, hopefully will still with us. Professor Tyrus, please. Uh, could you uh, unmute, please, please? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for throwing me the hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> I would make a distinction between war and uh, armed conflict and low intensity conflict. Both are nuclear powers and China is increasingly building up its nuclear weapons. And that is going to be a major constraint on letting incidents of operational nature or low intensity clashes uh, escalate to a broader war. The two, part, two countries also have a, a number of military management committees that are there to handle incidents that occur from time to time. Uh, the one, now, that's just a general proposition uh, that the US and China directly, but a conflict between China and Taiwan if caused by an invasion that would then trigger uh, a US response uh, or, and, and probably draw in allies is a much more likely scenario if, if China decides to take that initiative. And yes, it, it will be a war and it'll be a war of great destruction. In other words, with the land war in Ukraine, we see what's happened to the U Ukraine urban areas. Uh, it, it will be a destruction of, of Taiwan's infrastructure and China's coastal one. But I've put the prob probability off because it is being discussed. And the war in Ukraine, even though it's affecting the region badly at the moment, may have a silver lining in that uh, countries like China and elsewhere will look at the cost. And it's unique because economic sanctions are being applied as a direct counter weapon uh, to the use of aggression. And it also illustrates, like Vietnam did to the United States, that Ukraine, a smaller country, can, with certain types of argument, inflict great damage uh, on the, the major power aggressor, in this case, Russia. So uh, my, I could clearly be going back to my middle point and taking the lower end. It's these clashes in the air by unsafe maneuvering, the challenging the USS Decatur several years ago at sea, provoking a collision, or I spent three years at Pacific Command from 99 to 2001 when the Chinese hotshot pilot uh, did all these maneuvers around a lumbering EP3 prop drilling plane, and he ended up crashing in the sea. Uh, that, that was seen as a crisis, and the crisis management went into effect. So I think the, the, the rail lines uh, and safeguards are there. Uh, you can never say never, but I think the, the, a war would be catastrophic, but the probability is low. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a lot of... Uh condition, but uh, hopefully unlikely scenario, <laughs> hopefully for us to, uh, 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 <laughs> Dr. Dina, uh, is, uh, yeah. are you with, uh, Yes, with, yes, I'm with you. Please. Uh, have a, Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Asep. Uh, <clears throat> I am born after the Second World War, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I've never seen how, uh, how bad it was during the uh, Second World War, the First World War. But as a younger generation, I truly believe uh, that any war uh, would be devastating for any countries with heavy population uh, located at the crossroads and uh, with the history of the Cold War that has been very bloody as well in uh, Asia. So <clears throat> it is my intent that my legacy as uh, those also responsible currently uh, affecting uh, foreign policy, not to trigger anything that will be devastating for the next generation onward. So um, 
I noted very carefully uh, the tendency of uh, countries to launch uh, statements against each other uh, while mitigating or uh, hiding some of the aspects that they too have tried to do against others. Um, one thing I, uh, I want to draw your attention to is that China is part of the P5. The US is part of the P5. Russia is part of the P5. Mm. Among them, when they agree uh, to be the, uh, the power that, um, that has a special um, veto uh, effects in the United Nations, they share responsibility mm. to hold uh, responsibility to, to refrain from uh, race, uh, a proliferation of weapons and uh, arms race. So uh, to respond uh, to Mr. Fer Feramala, for instance, I think any race will never be done alone by one country. Uh, Russia did that, the US also did that, and the uh, um, um, China also does that. So what has been absent is the uh, respect to the UN Charter by all the P5 members. Recall that before all of these tensions uh, going worse uh, in Russia, uh, the US also have uh, dropped uh, the CNBT uh, agreement. So, um, and until now, we don't know what will be the uh, future of peace uh, with Iran, for instance, with the use of uh, nuclear weapons, for instance. So <clears throat> a lot is in our table today. Uh, President Joko Widodo from Indonesia has initiated a very uh, graceful uh, uh, approach yeah, in all this uh, uncertainty. And I really hope that other countries will follow suit, thinking that this is not about bilateral tensions. This is not about one country mm -hmm. against another. This mm -hmm. is about the missing piece in our uh, multilateralism, uh, the, the, the missing piece in our intent to uh, look how we, sh we can share the, uh, the space in the uh, increasing technology in uh, military industry uh, everybody wants to be the best. Everybody wants to, uh, to develop something that's spectacular. Uh, but to what uh, impact? What are the unintended consequences to the feeling of insecurity to some countries? This is a typical security dilemma situation. So, but we have had this before. <laughs> and we don't want this to end again, like the First World War or Second World War. We are not uh, countries uh, of Europe with those experience. Asian are much better in dealing with conflicts. And I hope that would, um, that would show yeah, in, in this uh, current generation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much, uh, Dina Prakto Raharja, speaking from Chiwide, Bandung, West Jakarta. And let's see, uh, and let's hear from a perspective from India. Dr. Premesa Saha, is that uh, any possibility of uh, open uh -huh. Open large scale war, um, in my opinion, there is very less probability. Um, see, um, directly between US and China. I agree with uh, Professor Thayer that uh, if there is an attack by China on any third country, um, be it in Taiwan or even for a you know direct conflict in the South China Sea, also in my opinion, um, there are less probabilities. But if ever, if since we are talking of hypothetical scenarios, if ever, then obviously it will trigger responses from countries like the US, especially among others, um, in in that scenario. But at the same time, um, you know, um, one also has to see that uh, Biden's statement, for example, he uh, did say that uh, we will cooperate with China where possible and compete with China when needed. So. It is more of competition rather than conflict at the moment. Um, that is one thing that needs to be seen. And also with, uh, say, with regard to uh, when we had the India-China clash um, at the border, it was not a full-scale war. It was uh, skirmishes and it was a clash at low intensity, though, though it impacted and it did affect lives in a big way. So even a low intensity clash can have an impact on lives. It is not just a 
uh, outscale uh, war, which like the case of Russia, Ukraine, for instance. But at the same time, during that time also, uh, we did see statements from countries, but not as such any active, um, if I can put it like that, uh, we did not see any great active stances from countries like say uh, US and Australia in uh, in case of countries also in those regards. Uh, so how a country would react is in a great way uh, dominated by its own national interest and its own foreign policy calculations. So that also has to be kept in mind. But uh, to answer your question, uh, full scale war, no, maybe low intensity conflicts um, in the South China Sea, but I talk about skirmishes, uh, but uh, when it is going to impact uh, a, a war, if that in those regards, if an, a high intensity clash happens in the South China Sea or say in Taiwan, then a response from US. But besides that, I don't see a probability of a US China war happening. Thank you. This is good news. I think uh, from Dr. Prem Shahan, not uh, conflict, uh, but uh, competition. That is a good word for us. Yeah. And let's uh, hear also uh, the, the, the next. Uh, a speaker, Ayaswani, speaking from New Delhi, India, I guess. Uh, and then, please, do uh, you have a, a perspective on whether uh, the war will be erupted uh, between, will be erupted between uh, two big countries in the near future? Dr. Ayaswani? Sorry, I did not get your question. I think whether uh, will be there any war between the U.S. and China in the near future? I I know I did not think so that there will be some sort of war or some sort of. But given the hegemonic behavior of China, it is pertinent to mention that U.S. should keep it as uh, alliance system open to all the countries of. Southeast Asia, South Asia, and even Central Asia. And secondly, U.S. should keep converging on the issues of China's belligerence and hegemonic behavior around its neighbors, especially when we see Galwan crisis in India and the crisis they two years back they when they wrote about that Central Asia is part of Greater China, all the Central Asian republics and there were pro protests. So this hegemonic behavior can be tamed only if America keep this aligned system, talking about this aligned system and taking into consideration the importance of these aligned system, especially around China. See, when we see America's policy towards Central Asia. It is not having any sort of coherence or convergence. They sent the they sent their representatives to Central Asia in one year and talk something, and there is no policy backup on these issues. So that is why I don't think in near future there will be war, but there may be there may be some sort of hegemonic posture in South China Sea by China or against any other neighbor that needs to be checked in by the in global players within an alliance system. They, America has to now think beyond NATO because most of the NATO countries have some sort of convergence on China, but the countries which are outside NATO did not have some sort of convergence on China. That is why America plus NATO should think some sort of convergence with those countries who are not part of the NATO against China, so that China behavior can be mended. When it comes, it is hegemonic pursuits and growing economic clout around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Dr. Ayazwani, and the, the last uh, comment from Jakarta, Mr. Anjaya, please. Yeah, thank you, Pa. Uh, as a, uh, I mean, uh, as a person, I love peace. I don't want any war in my lifetime. <laughs> that is that is my personal uh, 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 opinion. But of course, Indonesia is also is a peace-loving country. They do not want war. If you see the whole world, actually, nobody wants war. But only the situation which uh, is now 
because uh, the president xi jinping is very adamant very over confident uh, in uh, for example taking taiwan by force but if you see the repercussions what is happening in ukraine it is not easy uh, i mean uh, even though it is, china is so huge and so powerful and uh, taiwan is a small country but according to the estimates if taiwan want to take over it needs 2 million soldiers to control to manage to uh, uh, control taiwan 2 million soldiers and in that process so many thousands of people die from both sides not only from china not only, uh, but also from taiwan but these people are who both people in these two countries are chinese so chinese people are going to kill chinese people so it, it, it so that's why that is the reason i think that is the reason i think i in my personal opinion for the last 73 years china never dare to attack taiwan why because both sides people are the same people and they don't want because they, they will know the repercussions if once china uh, attacks taiwan so automatically the international uh, players will come in and also japan already said that they will also defend uh, taiwan and us also said but there is a strategic ambiguity in us uh, policies uh, so we don't know whether directly us will involve or not but we should know us has a mutual defense treaty with japan which now china is uh, uh, has problems with japan in the east china sea and also us has a defense treaty with korea and also us has defense treaty with the philippines so if in case china attacks these three countries it is an obligation for us to directly intervene but in case of taiwan it is not but anyway if you see the overall picture i think uh, china is also calculating it is so afraid if a war breaks out some experts say it will be the end of china it will be the end of communist china so like what happened in the like uh, japanese uh, period in you know, second world war nazi hitler what happened so uh, but only us has the not only the technology they have an economy which will not collapse because of war but in china it is untested they have only the last war is in 1979 with vietnam after that they did, do not did not have a big major war if war occurs the economy of china will be affected badly it will collapse if economy is not doing well it is the end of chinese communist rule that's my opinion thank you thank you very much uh, mr anjaya um, ladies and gentlemen this is a fantastic discussion and i believe this is also illuminating presentation from a uh, speaker professor taira from australia and dr pramesha saha from and ayaswani from india and then dr dina ananjaya also from indonesia uh, thank you very much please allow me on the on behalf of cisias to thank to all distinguished uh, speakers and audience also following uh, with the uh, youtube uh, streaming and thank you again see you in the future webinars and goodbye yeah thank you thank you yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm.